Okay, so we are now recording. Thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Rebecca Antel. I'm the Youth Services Consultant for the South Carolina State Library. We have with us today Chef Steve Harden from the Escoffier School of Culinary Arts. Um, this session is being recorded and we will share it out later over YouTube. Um, closed captioning is also available. If you click down at the bottom on the more button with the three little dots, you should have the closed captioning option. And I am going to hand it over to Chef Steve. Good morning this afternoon. I like to make that joke to you guys because usually I try to get a nap in in the middle of classes, but um, that's kind of my own icebreaker because <laughs> uh, I've had a busy day today. I am super happy to be with you guys. Um, I've already had two different schools, if, if I may rant. I've had two different schools already, multiple zoom that did then it didn't work and we went to google teams and then oh no um i had to, that finally worked but as any of us in the teaching field know uh when you don't get any answers to your question you end up just standing there and oh that's it. frustrating and was, yeah and that was what one of those classes was like and um uh, so we're through that then I went to Qdoba and I didn't do the, the app correctly. So I waited for 10 minutes for food that was already sitting on the shelf. Uh, let's see what else. Oh, and then I had to prep because I'm doing a thing for an open house tonight with, with campus. And so I had to prep a Zabagnon, which is a cool Italian word for essentially pudding with Marsala wine in it. But then you stick in the fridge. I'm, uh, I'm very interested in this. You're going to send me that recipe, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And th there's thousands of them out there. And so it's a similar to of like a panna cotta or. Yeah. Oh, yeah. If okay. that's related, although no gelatin, there's zero okay. gelatin in there. Okay. So it's your basic double boiler mm -hmm. without having to temper. So we take the tempering out of it. It's here's what it is. Um, and I'll send it to you. But uh, three egg yolks. This is just one recipe. There's other recipes for different textures that also include whites and things. But the one I made is three egg yolks, quarter cup of sugar, quarter cup of Marsala wine, or insert any of your favorite Italian wines, or any, I mean, you want to put some Franzi in there, go ahead. But huh. um, the wine, those are those three base ingredients, and then a touch of vanilla. And you beat the heck out of the eggs and sugar until you get to the thick ribbon stage. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So really, really thick, because you're gonna add a bunch of liquid to this. Mm -hmm. So it gets super thick, almost upwards of four to five minutes. Super light yellow and really thick. Not mashed potatoes thick, but not whipped cream thin. All right, somewhere in the middle. Four to five minutes is a good rule of thumb. And then you add your liquid, so your wine and your vanilla and that gets extra soupy, and that's when it goes on top of the double boiler, and you continue to either whisk by hand, hand mixer, and uh, till about 140. You need to get it to 140 for that food safety, unless you plan to eat it immediately. Right, and then it hasn't been in that danger zone long enough. For too long, yeah. To really to have to worry about it, but if you're going to ch hold it, if you're gonna chill it, if it, you need to get it up to past 140. For See, that I never worry a whole lot about that unless I'm cooking for other people. So I grew up on a dairy farm with raw milk. I drink a lot of raw milk now and raw kombucha. I'm like, my, my gut bacteria is, they've, they've got this handled. Right, right. If you, <laughs> and for the, and I agree completely. It, it's an odd game if you really want to break it down. Um, and the data really is this, uh, ladies and gentlemen, one in 56, thousand eggs okay right from the chicken on the surface are infected with a traceable amount detectable amount of salmonella oh, interesting. or take your pick mm -hmm. you know, typically it's salmonella or it can be e coli too but typically salmonella that's a detectable amount not even close to the amount that's going to get you sick so huh we get to when we crack our eggs. Might as well, let's talk about it. Why not? We got time. This isn't a very long, um, this actually is not a very long demo. Where'd my eggs go? Okay, here's one. So when you crack your egg, I, I'm not actually gonna do this, but uh, this was, but when you crack your egg, don't crack it on the edge. 
Don't crack it on the edge here. Do not crack it on the edge of anything, okay? So if you want to have the best, safest, okay, uh, pad your odds, you don't crack an egg on a sharp surface because where, you crack it on a flat. Where is the E. coli? Is it inside the egg? This is nature's armor, right? Okay, and then you gotta think, you know, there's biology about where this comes from and where the E. coli comes from and we'll leave it at that. But, right. so it's not inside. So you don't want, if, if you have an egg infected with salmonella or coated or it's enough to get you sick, you got a couple of ways to help yourself stay healthy. Crack it on a flat surface, wherever. So you get the flat edge of the egg. So it flattens out. We got kind of some bright light here today. So you, it flattens out, you get the flat spot. Well, that's where you put your thumbs to pull the eggshells apart, mm -hmm. turn it. And so the outside stays on the outside, outside. and we don't cross contaminate the egg on itself. See, then now we're all going to be practicing cracking eggs now tomorrow morning. You took it up to that 140. Yeah. Yep. So if you really have a concern, all right, that's, that's real. Your feelings are real. Okay. But the facts are um, you can use past, get pasteurized eggs. They're more expensive. They're harder to find, but you can get them, you know, shipped in pasteurized eggs. We are one of the only countries that refrigerates our eggs. Which I've always found fascinating. I, I don't usually. Yeah, you don't have to. And so here's why when they see them sitting on my counter. I know, right? So it's, it's kind of an educational little pet peeve I have. Let's get that data, <laughs> that information out there, really. But here's why we, we refrigerate our eggs. Yes, there is this factor of fear and panic irrationally about foodborne illness, but it actually has to do with spread, with the freshness, because fresh is not about food safety necessarily, depending on context. So a egg right out of the chicken, right? You will walk in your, like Rebecca, like you did growing up. You, you grab from the, you go to the chicken coop, you get, oh, there's breakfast, crack. You know, you fight the chicken the for chicken it, food. you take it to the kitchen. There you go. It's been out the chicken for, you know, it's been out from under the heater for 10 minutes. I don't know. And whack, you crack your egg. So spread, there's, three parts to an egg. There's the yolk, there's a primary white and a secondary white. The primary is the thick one that you can actually see. The other one, you can, you can actually see the shape and the convex nature of it. Then the, the third or the third part of second albumin is the watery one on the outside. So when you crack an egg, okay, fine, I'll just do it. When you crack an egg in- You're gonna have to in, zoom in so we can see it. Yeah. When you crack an egg in the pan, and I'll, I'll just pull it up to the camera. I'm, I'm running solo today. When you crack it up to the pan, or in the pan, you have... Doo -doo -doo -doo. Nope, nope, oh, wait a minute. Nope. I have the close-up camera. I forgot about that. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Close-up camera. So you have there we the go. egg yolk. Let me tilt it that way. You have the egg yolk, you have that darker light yellow, and then you have the watery bits on the outside. So the fresher the egg, the tighter everything is going to be, and you have less spread. Mm -hmm. The egg doesn't whoop, go fill the whole pan. So an egg left out on the counter will age in a day, will age the same amount of time as an egg in the fridge for a week. The cold slows down the degradation of the protein, the softness of what we call the chalice, which are those two little white bits on either side of the yolk, which suspend the yolk in the middle. That, 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 that's why the yolk stays in the center of the egg, no matter what the top or the bottom, because it's suspended by two tight, 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 tight wound proteins called the chalice. That's really just a vocab fun fact. It's not that important. But <laughs> That's what's going on with our egg. Um, also, we take advantage of the two egg whites when we poach. If you really want to be extra, extra cool when you poach an egg is live TV. What are you going to do? You strain out that watery bit. Oh. Hmm. Which is where the wispies come from. Interesting. 
because it's not as thick and tight mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Not watery and so you can strain it out might as well why not this is about education and learning okay so you've got your strainer if you don't have one of these in your kitchen you need to get at least one I'll get that out i of don't way. have one i need one And of course, you want to do that without breaking the, the yolk, especially if you're going to poach. But see that coming through the sieve like water? That's the that would turn into all the wispies. Huh. We take advantage of that property when we're doing egg drop soup, wonton soup, fried rice. Okay, where we want those ribbons. Right. When we're doing some other Italian dishes, um, like a stracciatella. We actually call that stracciatella, which is Italian for ribbon. So we take advantage of that property sometimes, or when we want to poach a really perfect egg, these are going to be smaller, okay? But you strain all that out, and then you're just going to poach this part. Bloop, and it'll drop. I wouldn't do this egg because it's pretty, you know, disjointed from the yolk to begin with. It's just the nature of, you know, luck of the draw when you're cracking in an egg. But that, is going to turn into really nice solid whites. Interesting. So a nice tight egg. Yeah. This wispies, all the little wispies. No matter what you were to do with the tornado, with the whirlpool, with acid, cream of tartar, whatever, it's going to mm -hmm. still be all wispy. Doesn't matter when you're doing a meringue. You just go for it. It's all proteins, protein at that point. So. Question, might as well. While I'm kind of resetting, I need to clean my pan to do the chicken. Fire away, everybody. What about keeping butter out of the refrigerator? Okay, that's an interesting one. Butter, you have the, and here's why we created margarine for two reasons. Butter is a unsaturated fat for the most part. It has saturated fat in it, but butter is an unsaturated fat. And rancidity, so fats that go bad, is caused by having an unsaturated fat. Saturated fats pretty much don't go rancid. And that's because that open molecule spot, if you will, okay, picture a, a, a roller coaster that's got an open seat. No credit for this analogy. I stole it from Alton Brown. Um, it has an open seat. That's a mono unsaturated fat. If it's got more than one open seat, it's a poly unsaturated fat. And mostly we have to do with iron molecules and some other stuff out in the air. And it latches on and that's what turns it rancid. Saturated fat, there's nothing for that to go on, for that to hook onto. And so they don't go rancid. And chilling them slows that whole process down, just kind of like anything in biology and life. We, you don't want to move very fast if you're cold, right? You just kind of sit there, same thing. So butter will go rancid eventually, but you have to balance how often do you use it? Do you go through the product before it has a chance to go rancid? You're easily talking three weeks to a month, most likely, before it becomes yeah, horrible if you leave it on your counter. So that's really up to you. If we're talking lab coat, you know, well actually guy science, yeah, it's gonna go rancid. There's nothing really we can do about that. Well, there is, we just use it before it goes bad. That's one of the interesting things too about, you know, the reasons why, it's sort of like why all the coffee cups now have a warning on them that says this is hot if you spill it on yourself. Because way back when, somebody got sick from leaving butter out and so we just decided that we were going to refrigerate it all sort right. of like way back when they didn't have really great practices for for raw dairy and so rather than telling the farmers that they should be more careful and telling the people that they needed to store it better they just pasteurized and homogenized it instead they just Correct. They, they they solved the problem wholesale instead of working it out on an individual level right fix the symptom as opposed to the cause Yes. Which on that note, guess what? Contaminated meat does not get you sick. That is right. Undercooking 
contaminated meat gets you gets sick. You sick. So it's not necessarily, you guys remember um, Sizzler way back in the day? They were one of the first ones to have an E. coli outbreak and it practically destroyed their whole business. Then there was uh, Jack in the Box was another national known yep. one for E. coli. It's not the fact that they had, yes, it is. They had, they had a health code violation but the meat is not what gets you sick. It's the fact they didn't cook it to a safe temperature. And now we're back to know your meat packer. Local could be better than mass produced. Uh, we minimize the hands touching, which minimizes the chances of contamination. Uh, contamination. Then in turn, we cook it to a safe temperature and then we don't have to worry about it. Okay, you could, you know, go get the most bacterially infested glass of water from a puddle in the swamp in the middle of the jungle and boil it. And it would be fine. Fine. Right? Um, you might want to let it cool down first. But you, yeah, you see my point? So there's a lot of these beliefs. They're not wrong in their science, but they may be more symptomatic, like Rebecca said, fixing it wholesale instead of educating on, on the baseline. So proper sanitation procedures, all these different things in place, universal pre precautions and protections that we use in the kitchen, um, knowing our temperatures, um, which we're actually gonna get into today a little bit, the different- Kitchen thermometer, one here. of the most useful tools I would say is the kitchen oh, yeah. thermometer. Yep. And then within the advanced class, it becomes your hands you know, in feeling the meat and stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but if you're not cooking for someone else in a professional kitchen and the chef yells at you for jabbing it with the thermometer, um, who cares? You're cooking for yourself. Right? <laughs> so a lot of things to balance and think about there. So questions, because uh, before we... Oh, cookie dough, okay. No more or less okay than um, raw dairy or any raw egg. Well, cookie dough, I'll put it this way. Cookie dough tastes awesome. Who doesn't and like again, raw cookie dough? If you have a concern, use pasteurized eggs. I have an irrational concern of being eaten by a shark. So you don't swim in the ocean. Correct. So, but it's irrational based on the data. It is irrational for you to get E. coli from a raw egg. The odds are astronomical. Can it happen? Sure. You can still get hit by a car if you cross the street when the, when the little man shows up and said, it's your turn. My dad called that dead right. Well, you still might want to look. <laughs> okay. So anyway, I digress. We could chat with, this is another fantastic episode of Chef Steve <laughs> with the library. This is great. Okay. So let's review. Let's actually dive into the content, shall we? Share screen. Quick review of what we did last week, because I'm going to build on it for this week's presentation and demonstration. So we talked about Escoffier. Nice safety techniques, technique, technique, technique. That was the big takeaway word. One of the big takeaway words from last week was technique focused, right? There was two key buzzwords, one that holds the knife and one holds the food. Do you guys remember which was which? It has to do with technique. What do we call how we hold the knife? I've got the chat open too, just in case, but feel free to unmute if you want to verbalize. How do we hold the knife? Pinch grip, good job. Yep, pinch, 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 pinch. Right above the handle at the bolster. The fact it's called the bolster again is just vocab, but um, pinch grip, yep. Oh, I forgot I'm sharing my screen. I'm holding it up to the camera and stuff. Pinch grip. And then the three fingers come behind. What do we call the other hand? The one that holds the food. There's a technique. Yep, claw. The claw. The claw or thing from Adam's family. The takeaway is fingertips stay up. You don't get on that outside part of your hand or you'll have stories like chef's feet. So, yep. Cutting boards, which, one, which one's bad for knife edges? Wood, plastic, or glass? Glass. Yeah, glass is bad. 
Be comfortable. Remember, don't lock your knees. Pinch grip, claw. We did the pico de gallo. Session two, what are we gonna do today? So we just did our review. What does cooking do? The word cook. Okay, the verb, not the noun. What does cooking do? We have three ways in science, in the world, to take heat from one place and put it in another. One way that heat energy transfers, excuse me, three ways. Conduction, convection, radiance. So let's talk examples. So that's, this again is your vocab stuff, you guys. But let's just talk practical application. Conduction. Ow, that's hot. That's conduction. Okay, contact. The heat energy is transferring through contact of two surfaces that are not the same temperature. Heat and energy is interesting. It wants balance. Obviously not that it has a mind of its own, but it wants to be equalized. So heat is always going to go to towards what heat, where heat isn't. Heat takes over everything. So conduction, ow, hot, burn. Convection, that's a hairdryer. Or a convection oven. Okay, a hot box with a fan in it. Incidentally, a blast chiller is a cold box with a big fan in it. Same thing, convection. So the process of movement around the item we are attempting to heat, to transfer heat into, okay? And then we have radiant. Anybody come up with a really big, eight billion miles away example of radiant heat? I think it's eight billion. No, it's not. It takes eight seconds for the light to get here. The sun, a heat lamp. Those of you that use a hairdryer or didn't have a hairdryer on vacation and you had to stand under the heat lamp in the um, hotel bathroom to dry your hair, took a while, right? I don't know if you've ever done that or not, but just follow me on the, in, the, in the idea here. You can stand under the heat lamp and it'll dry your hair. Hair dryer is much faster. One is radiant, one is convection. That's the difference. So these are the three ways that we can transfer heat. And that's it. Then we can dive deeper into forms of cooking or cooking methods. You have dry and you have wet. And I don't actually have a slide on this, unfortunately, but you have dry and you have wet. Wet means water. So poaching, steaming, simmering, okay? These are wet using, radi using conduction Steaming also does use a little bit of radiant heat as well, but using conduction. Steaming actually is all three, but you know, we have the combination. I bring this up to another little fun fact quiz. Which one do you think deep fry is? Conduction, convection, or radiant? Or excuse me, wet or dry? Deep frying, wet or dry cooking? Yet that's what you would think. And it's not really a twi trick question, but it sounds like it. It's dry because there's no water. Even though it's a liquid, it's not water. So that's that difference. It's, yes, it's a liquid. We're deep frying in a liquid, but that's not water. It can't be water. Why? Because we deep fry at about 350 degrees. Water goes bye-bye at 212. It boils off, turns to steam and disappears and goes out into the world. That's why. So keep that in mind. This is also, you can't brown. That's why I brought it up. You cannot brown. Food will not caramelize or brown in the presence of steam because water is going to take away that heat at 212 degrees. The Maillard reaction and caramelization happen much higher, 320 about 290 to 320 is the Maillard reaction, which is the browning of protein and, and other sugars. So that's grill marks. And then caramelization happens at 340. So water's gone 
at this point. So you can't brown anything. Steaming doesn't brown. And that's a practical thing. You guys just know that, right? Things don't get brown when you steam them. But they do when you throw them under the broiler. You, they do when you leave them in the pan or you throw them on the grill. And the difference is the temperature. So that's, that's why. So brown food, good. More science. When we brown food, we are literally creating new flavor. And that is the literally the proper term of the word literal. Or proper use of the word literal. A little shout out to um, social media miscreants out there. That is the right, literally, we are literally creating new flavors through what's called the Maillard reaction or, and or caramelization. And then the, well, really the other one, it's still Maillard reaction, um, but which uses oxidation to not get too chemistry class on you guys, but um, the browning of fruit is also oxidation. And acid interrupts that, which is why we squeeze lemon juice on the avocado or apples or those fruits that brown. Now, I have this note of safety zone here. Okay. Forever and ever and ever, the safety zone was 40 to 140. Really easy to remember. Excuse me, the danger zone was 40 to 140. 40 degrees on the down end. For above 140 on the hot end. Anywhere in there, bacteria is going to grow. I think now ServeSafe teaches 38 to like 142 if you really want to split hairs. Um, I will admit I'm not a ServeSafe instructor, so the current what's okay and what isn't, I'm not privy to in terms of the curriculum. 40 to 140 is fine. But why do we have to bring chicken to 160? Oh, I do have a graphic on it, I forgot, it's been a while. Uh, why do we have to bring chicken to 165 degrees? Hmm. If 140 is where bacteria start dying and it has to do with the length of time our food is at that temperature. 140 degrees and then we hold it, it needs to be upwards of five minutes. At 140 degrees, the bacteria is dead. The viruses are dead. So whatever you're trying to kill when you by cooking. 165, four seconds. So that is the balance between ordering that medium rare steak or medium steak is the length of time. Because well done, you guys, doesn't mean dry. If you've ordered well done and it's dry and inedible, the cooks don't know what they're doing. Well done is one of the hardest ones to hit and to be done properly without making it dry. But that's the big difference that you're looking at is length of time our food is at that temperature. So, and then I have some notes on plating, which I'll actually come back to. Uh, but the big takeaway here, you guys, is negative space and height. I actually intend to do a whole unit next week when we do the caramel apples um, on plating and presentation. But uh, negative space and height are the two most important when designing a chefy, foo foo, elegant style plate of food. Questions? I actually missed a few things that I intend to talk about here in terms of slides. So. And I'll cover them when I do the when I do the techniques. Um, I'm going to stop sharing, so we have highlight on the video here. So when we talk about cooking, okay, there's three ways to denature a protein. Okay, same thing with denatured alcohol. Um, wh what we were talking earlier about gluten. Okay, denaturing of a protein that takes that tight tight, we're going to talk about proteins, not fats and carbs, but we denature the protein. So that's where the colors come from when you brown food and cook food and why it changes color for the most part. Tight protein strands, because food is either going to be a fat, a carb, or a protein or a combination, right? So we take these super tight strands 
and either through the application of heat, cooking, agitating it, kneading dough, or acid, chemical, think ceviche. You denature the protein, you soften it up and it opens up. That is what we do when we cook. When proteins change color, when shrimp go from clear to that translucent, well, they're not really clear, but you know what I mean, right? Raw shrimp has that color and then it gets, it turns cooked. Raw chicken, it turns the color when we cook it. Okay, that has to do with the interaction of the proteins. And then there is some other science with fats and whatnot, but the acid doesn't um, affect those like heat does. So denaturing of protein is what we really focus on when we're cooking. Then we have the, the secondary function of the danger zone. Let's kill bacteria. And so they both happen. If you focus on one, the other one's going to happen. Why? Because we're increasing the temperature of things. So we form and denature those proteins in the dough when we need it because mechanically we rub those two amino acids, subproteins together that lock together to form gluten. So mechanical agitation, whipping egg whites, same thing. Okay, we get that matrix formed, but we don't add heat. We add heat. Now that fried egg, right? It turns white. <sighs> Ironically, kind of the same thing, isn't it? A cooked egg white and a meringue. That's why they're white. So we've denatured those, those proteins, we've realigned them. So we're going to do all of the above. We're going to have a little bit of caramelization due to natural sugars in the chicken. We're going to have Maillard reaction, okay, which is the browning main browning when you when you sear something off and then we have the denaturing of the proteins and then of course along the way we're going to make it safe so technique first things first we have our setup here for our chicken street tacos okay my mise en place meaning everything is in its place chicken thighs that i have put in paper towel to dry them off step number one super important when you're going to sear meat, you want it dry. Why? You can't brown in the presence of steam. That's going to add a steam barrier. Micro tiny wise here, right? Microscopically. But we don't want that to happen. We want this as dry as possible. We're going to, we have our pico de gallo. Not what we made last week. I actually did, just did this about 40 minutes ago. But we, we made it last week. My home, homegrown, homespun, home blend of taco seasoning. Six corn tortillas, a tomato and a lime. So we'll review a little bit. I'll review that canoe cut and I'll review dicing. But we have our chicken here. Okay. My burner, my pan is on. Medium heat. When I'm using my electric stove, you guys, I sear meat on four, believe it or not, with a little patience. I, don't, I have enough patience to sear meat, not to bake bread, but a little bit of patience, preheat your pan. Two reasons, you want a nice even heat all over the metal and your pan is not designed to sit under high heat empty. You're gonna hurt the pan. High heat, we use to boil water and to cook on a wok or reduce a sauce. That's about it, okay? So I'm on about medium flame here. Now I'm using gas, the butane burner. These are great, by the way. This is actually what they use in competition. This might even be what you guys have, um, the gas one or the Coleman, you know, the portable click burner, sometimes called German burners. I, I don't know. I can't speak to exactly what you guys have but portable and awesome. So little seasoning. Seasoning for the most part does not mean your flavor combination, your spice rub. When a chef says season, they mean salt and pepper. So salt, pepper. 
These are just bone out chicken thighs that I bought from Safeway. Some tongs. Okay, because you don't want to flip, you don't want to go into your seasoning, take your hand, flip your meat, and then go back into your seasoning. That is cross contamination by definition. So, a little salt, a little pepper. The pan's already hot, I can tell. That's just experience, the, the heat intensity from how close my hand gets. You'll, there are tricks to learn and gauge. I'll show you one here, okay? More science, it's called the Leidenfrost effect. When water bounces in a pan, you might be able to see. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Come on. I was trying to zoom in. Mine. Doesn't want to zoom in. There we go. So the Leyden frost effect. Yes, it sounds like Lederhosen and good luck not saying Lederhosen. I do all the time when I mean Leyden frost. When water bounces or two dramatically dissimilar liquids. Okay, so what you get, this pan isn't quite hot enough for the Leyden frost. Um, it was Professor Leyden frost, a German guy, big surprise, that figured it out or that coined it. Um, the surface of the water molecules turn to steam encapsulating the rest of the water and that's why the water bounces around instead of immediately evaporating. It's called the Leyden frost. And we use that to see if our pan's hot enough, okay? There's a lot of cool videos actually about it out on the internet. Um, molten oil poured over the cheeseburger. It looks kind of cool. It doesn't burn the cheeseburger. It just flows away. It's called the Leyden frost. So we have hot pan. Notice I haven't put the heat, the oil on it yet. Canola oil, olive oil, either one, it doesn't matter. As long as you control your heat. Olive oil is actually five degrees. Um, higher in smoke point than canola oil. Okay, 405 degrees versus 400. Oil, nice little coating. Okay, you can either oil the pan or oil the chicken, it doesn't matter. I'm looking for a sheen. It may or may not come through on the close up, but I just want it to shimmer a little bit. Take your chicken away from you. Why? Because if you drop it this way, okay, that's why you should always have your bathrobe on if you're making bacon. So, <laughs> story. So, this is a, I'm cheating with this pan, you guys. This is a ceramic pan, but I can do this all day, and so can you in a stainless steel pan. Manage your heat. Okay, I'm looking for tiny little bits of steam and stuff. That's, that's kind of what we want. Whoops, wrong way. There we go. That's a good close up. So all I'm gonna do here is brown it. My yard reaction. I can't remember if there's one or two L's, but it's M-A-I-L-L-A-R-D. He's just the guy who's credited with figuring out what's going on when we brown protein. So I'm not cooking. I'm not doing a final cook. I'm just searing. I'm browning. I'm adding texture. And this could stand to go a little bit longer. But in the interest of time, um, I'm going to flip it. If you're curious, okay, oh, here, let me see if this will show on the, on the close-up without knocking this over. The knob is right here. So if I were to say zero is noon and high is way down here, I'm on... 
9.30. Preheated pan, check for heat, add the oil. Do not add your oil first because the oil will smoke before it gets up to proper temperature, before the pan is preheated to proper temperature, okay? Steph, I feel like a lot of recipes say to preheat the oil. Only if you're pan frying would be the only time okay. that that is acceptable. Okay. Only if you're pan frying, whether it be a shallow fry, um, maybe a saute, if you're going to go like a stir fry, you're going to preheat the oil. But you're always, always, always preheat a dry pan. Then, so you want your pan, so it's always in steps. It's never cold oil, cold pan. Or in other words, if you can't go wrong by doing it that way. I'll put it that way, okay? Interesting. So we have our seared chicken. It's still raw in the middle, right? Our way we go. This is gonna go over here. Now, oh gosh, wood board. I actually just oiled and treated this, so I know it's safe. If you guys remember from last week, I have a saying about meat on a, on wood, but that evening I treated the, the rest of the board since I had some questions about how do you treat a wood board. Um, I got my bamboo one out and made sure I did it. Um, okay, so our pan is still wicked hot. I'm gonna kind of let that relax a little bit. Heat is off, okay, no heat. I'm going to set this aside. Can you guys still hear me? Hear me? Okay. Audio quality. I turned the fan on behind me. Okay, good. So I'm also going to let those rest just a little bit. Which is funny. Oops. I didn't plan for more than one cutting board. So we'll set these over here. Grab another board. Let's review. So make your Pico. TV magic. I've already done that. But let's review real quick that canoe cut. Pinch grip. This is that difficult one or that odd one where you flatten the knife in your hand instead of turning like this. You flatten the knife so you can look on the inside and the near side and the far side of the tomato and get both sides in one shot. So you come right inside here because this is what we're going to dice up. Flat knife, pinch up here, flat here, fingers on top is fine. I'm pinching the knife here between here and here. One finger, two fingers, doesn't matter. Sawing motion, no scooping. Review because of the safety piece, don't scoop. Hold your food in place and saw underneath. And then you've got your guts to get rid of. If you're doing a sauce, keep that. If not, just get rid of it. Run your thumb through to, Kind of clean that up. Okay, we have our plank. Fingertips hold the food. Knuckles guide the knife, right? Because if I start to get flat, I'm gonna start snipping the tip of my fingers off. Remember, stories, we don't wanna do that. I like to slice. You can do a chop if you want, but I like to do a slice when I'm doing the strips, the julienne, batonade. Wide food, wider claw, same thing. Fingertips hold the food down and forward so we don't splay out those long strips, the juliennes or batonets or fine juliennes, whatever we're doing, okay? And three-dimensional squares called cubes. So that's how we do that diced anything. Take some, the lime classically is always skin side down because nature's armor, but stories, so flat side. Again, this is Chef Steve's technique. It is a deviation from a classic way to teach it. Set your knife, stabilize your food using your whole arm. Saw, I mean, I'm pushing pretty good because the lime is pretty stout. And so you are in control of your food, not the other way around. And then you pulverize the lime, get that in there. If you wanna follow a recipe, you squeeze the lime into another vessel and then measure it out. But I don't care, get all that lime in there. All right, and then quick mix on your pico. 
Now, I'm not using ships in this case, so I can go ahead and season and adjust and not have to worry about oversalting. There is no salt in my um, taco mix. Okay, the key ingredient in my taco is, and I believe, did I send, Ms. Antel, Rebecca, did I send you the recipes? Because I can, if I haven't before. I'm happy I don't think to. you have yet, no. Okay, my fault, sorry about that. Um, the key ingredient in taco, the taco taste is cumin. That, that's your key flavor. That's your key is cumin. And so it's chili powder, cumin, barbecue, barbecue. Um, and don't worry about writing this down, you guys. Um, um, I'll send you the recipe, but it's adobo seasoning, chili powder, uh, cumin, garlic powder, onion powder, oregano, preferably Mexican oregano. Um, That's it, actually. Mm, 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 mm. Yeah, that's it. And then it's just a balance of your personal preference. Some people want more chili powder, others want more cumin. Chili powder is a is 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 a smoother, smokier, because that's what it is. It's actually smoked <laughs> dried chilies that are ground up. Um, cumin, you know, is its own thing. That's that. You walk in the door, you go to Taco Bell, you it smells like tacos. That's cumin or, or cumin or cumino of what you're smelling. So our pan is still a medium. I mean, I still wouldn't want to just put my hand in it, but here's something you guys might be surprised at. They do this all over in Latin America. Toast your seasoning. Medium medium, low, okay, we just want it warm, fragrant. Toast your seasoning. Yeah, I, I like these bottles, okay? Yeah, it's how we do, mainly do things in the restaurants or ladles and stuff. These are amazing. Amazon, it's a lot cheaper. Um, real quick, I'll talk about the oils. Woo, that was close. I'll talk about the oils. Um, I use canola oil for almost everything, unless I'm specifically doing Italian and I want that olive oil flavor. The healthiest, at least for now, until they, whoever they is, comes up with one that is healthier, is avocado oil, but it is wicked expensive. And it's also the highest smoke point. You can deep fry easily in, in avocado oil but you have to think of the flavor profile, okay? In this case, tacos, I mean, a little bit of a layer of avocado flavor, mm, yum, would actually work out pretty good. But that's one of the main reasons we, because chefs, we consider different oils. Chefs live in the world of flavor, okay? I'm not a nutritionist or dietitian. Yes, I know enough to be dangerous, but- Well, and, and like you said, avocado oil is wicked expensive. And how much oil have you really used? About a tablespoon and a half at the most. For three servings, four servings? Uh, this recipe as is makes six. No. One, two, three, six, two, three, three. I think it's either three or four. And really it comes down to how, how um, big you cut the chicken. Uh, I'm so doing the amount of oil style, that so. you're getting per yeah. serving is negligible from frankly negligible exactly the word I was going to use <laughs> from, from 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 the canola oil that's that's relatively considered healthy right now but like you said it could change tomorrow because we like butter we don't like butter it should be clarified butter it should be no butter it should be lard it shouldn't right. be lard it should all be shortening shortening is going to kill us all I Ooh, ah I'm glad you mentioned that actually because I have my own place on this um, shortening, the reason it is called shortening is we're shortening the protein strands. Um, I actually had to look that up. I was curious one day. It's we're shortening the protein strands. And, but shortening is a trans fat. Why do we call them trans? You guys take a guess. Take a guess. Why is it called trans?
transformed from a liquid to a solid. And trans fats are saturated fats. Don't go rancid. That margarine stays around for a while, doesn't it? Your body can't do anything with them. Bad for your body, trans fat bad. I was going to say, that it doesn't means, break down. That's why it's so bad for you. It doesn't break down. Correct. Saturated fat. Okay. The roller coaster's full. Can't do anything with it. It's also not supposed to be a solid. It's supposed to be a liquid this stuff so you throw some hydrogen atoms at it heat it up spin it in a centrifuge squeeze it through little extruder openings and you get a semi-solid called margarine or partially hydrogenated vegetable oil science chemistry chemical it's not fresh it's not natural lard so the lard beef tallow pork lard Okay, there are no cholesterol, fat, fat, bad. No, saturated fat, bad. So now we have a debate of how much saturated fat is maybe in beef tallow versus saturated fat in pork lard um, and all of the above. Okay, what we do know is actually um, that this is a little too much liquid, so we're gonna crank that heat. Um, no, we're not. Poof. We're gonna crank the heat, there we go. So we get into things like, like we were, you know, we're saying in Jeff, butter bad, butter not bad. Butter has been great for thousands of years. I, I don't know the history, I have to look it up, maybe 400 years. Uh, probably since we domesticated cattle, we've been doing things with butter, however long it's been discovered. Um, it's unsaturated fat. Maybe it's mono. Yes, there's saturated fats in it. Naturally, we have that in our bodies and organic organisms have that, but it's an amount, not pure saturated fat like shortening. So that's a debate for the nutritionists and dietitians. Me, chef, butter, good. <laughs> um, so what we're doing now, you guys, is we're going to reduce this liquid and what we're actually gonna do is braise. So we seared and then I'm gonna finish this chicken by braising it. So it's seared off and sawing motion. I don't wanna squish it. It's definitely still raw. but here's where the amount of servings come in. How small do you wanna make your chicken? You think through to the end of how you wanna eat it or how you wanna serve it, your guest. Um, do you want them to bite down a big chunks of chicken? How well do you like them? I don't know, that's up to you. But yield, you'll get a good somewhere between three, six, nine, twelve 12 tacos out of two average size chicken size. Thighs are common. Thighs are less expensive. Okay, so if you're on the street um, in any of the Latin American neighborhoods in the U.S. or anywhere overseas and street vendors, okay, this is street food. Thighs are the cheapest. Okay, this is what you're going to find is the thighs. So, they also have a lot more flavor. And you were, you know, this goes back to what you were saying earlier about you're a chef, you go for flavor. We've been taught to use boneless, skinless chicken breasts, and those have like the least amount of flavor of any cut. Why? What's the big difference? There's no fat. Yes, the use, but you're exactly fat. Fat is flavor, fat, soluble flavors. All right, fine. We'll just use my knife. I think my bench scraper is in the dishwasher. So in we go. We're going to put a light braise on this. Um, too much liquid. That's my fault. I forgot I meased out one and a half. So a braise, by definition, you want to be halfway up. But we've seared this, so we already added those layers of flavors. So we're going to, going to actually get kind of a half and half sear or braise poach, which is fine. Which, which is totally fine. 
I'm used to a bigger pan or I'm just really good at making excuses and covering up for things that happen on a presentation that I'm not expecting. <laughs> you decide. So when it comes to, so let, let's review presentation techniques here, you guys. One, confident in what I'm doing. That just comes from practice, but engaging of the audience. So it's great when you can have your audience have their cameras on. High school, it doesn't happen as often as you'd like, or you get used to seeing four heads. Okay, you get, you know, you get this. This is all you see. It's just their forehead on their camera. Um, it, it is what it is in a lot of cases. But when you have visual, um, ladies like you three, I can, I get that, you get that personal interaction. When you get the interaction on the chat. And, and that's not to say anything about those of you that don't have your cameras on. Totally fine. Uh, we have interaction in the chat too. So um, you take your cues from your audience. and talk through what you're doing. <laughs> Hi, Wendy. Um, totally didn't mean it that way, but I like seeing faces. <laughs> um, you talk about what you're doing, personal anecdotes, personal stories. You know, I, I make the joke when doing knife cuts about stories. Well, one that fosters engagement. Now they're curious. Is he gonna tell the story? Is he making it up? Is okay. What is the story, especially with kids? Ooh. Um, then have some data to, available to answer related questions. You know, um, again, it comes from experience. Doing it a couple times, you get an idea. Most of the time, you get the same questions, even though they're different people. You get the same questions over and over and over again. Um, for example, I've gotten the what about eggs question, you know, for years uh, because it's not common knowledge. And if you in your crowd, you're going to have multiple, you're going to have the quiet ones, you're going to have the talkative ones, guess which one I was. You're going to have people that, um, you know, have a question all the time. You could have folks very easily, especially in a public library program. My daughter is, uh, has Asperger's, she's on the spectrum and will ask random questions that are important to her, but the everyday folk don't think it's relevant, you know? So you have to be prepared for that. And of course, um, understanding and accepting uh, where to, to indulge that question. And indulge isn't the right word because an answer is uh, warranted no matter what. So that's kind of the wrong word, but how long do you let that go? You know, and that's personal technique, style, consideration for the entire room versus not having that alienating that one individual so it's it's you know it's a juggling act um but like for example i had a i i put up a list of ingredients i was doing farm to table and land label reading today for a class and i could tell i had a student who was on the spectrum is kept asking a lot of question after question after question you know didn't take the cues to move on and finally did and then I had some ingredients up on the and I, it was a test here's not a test but a quiz hey try to figure out what this is and it filled the whole screen and it was Totino's pizza rolls um and he, he answered in chat I said what do you guys think this is and he said ingredients touche you're not wrong this is a list of ingredients so yeah we we as a parent of a special needs child um you know, it is important that we include all those questions. So um, way too much liquid here. Really only going to need about three quarters of a cup of liquid for this recipe, because this is also going to be my taco sauce to reduce. So what are we going to do? I could sit here and wait for it to all boil out. Or we'll just pour some off. We'll just pour a little off, no big deal. I'm only gonna do three of these. I mean, I have way too much product to begin with here for three tacos, um, but this is dinner. <laughs> so we have our tacos and we're gonna reduce this down. So we have steps to review. We toasted the spices, that brings out more flavor. 
okay? Aromatic nature, the oils, we excite everything that's going on, okay? I light a fire under you, you're gonna get excited, right? Same thing. Uh, <laughs> she's like, mm -hmm. So we've created some more things going on here. We seared the chicken to add a layer of that caramelization and or Maillard reaction. It's more Maillard because there, there is natural sugars, but I don't want to get, this isn't chemistry class here. Um, typically with meat, it's Maillard reaction. If you want to be well actually person, yes, there's caramelization there. So we're going to reduce this. What are we reducing, you guys? When we reduce something, what are we reducing? We're reducing two things. So we reduce the volume by doing what? Don't overthink it. And it's gonna get thicker, right? We know that. We thicken by reducing it. So we reduce the volume of something by reducing, yes, exactly right, boiling the liquid, but think through it a little bit deeper. What is leaving? The water is... Water. Water content. So, if something is too thick and we want to thin it out, what do we add? Water, for the most part. Just something's too thick, you can add some water, thin it out. Well, if it's too thin, doesn't it make sense to, let's get rid of some water? And how do you get rid of water? you boil it. And that is called reducing. We reduce the volume because water disappears, literally leaves through science, okay? Liquid, steam, bye-bye, okay? Ask anyone with glasses, okay? We, <laughs> right? You can see it when your dish is steaming, water is leaving. It's thickening up. It's one of those things in cooking, it's one of those deceptively simple, but once you have the vocabulary, it's like, that makes perfect sense. We add water to thin something out, so remove water to thicken it. How do you remove water? You boil it, i.e. reduce. So we've concentrated because we don't, we haven't diluted, we're undiluting for, to make a word up here, right? That seasoning is gonna be concentrated in flavor. That's another reason we do it in this step, in these stages. You can do the same thing with that little packet of McCormick if you want, okay? So I've got a pan over here on medium heat. I'm just gonna throw my um, tortillas in that. Both tortilla in the stack. Because one's gonna start to heat up and the other one is gonna steam slightly and then I'm gonna flip them. And what I kind of look for is this top one to start to curl up a little bit. So we look for it to kind of curl up slightly like that. And then you can just flip them over. Ha, nope, didn't work. So, and then you flip that over. If I had my timing right, you guys, I would have this set aside to kind of rest, and then I would do the tortillas right here, but I had that way too much liquid, and again, for you to figure out if I did that on purpose or not. So, we have our tortillas. We can kill the heat now. I mean, that's cooked. We have our two tortillas here. So I like to do it this way also because the inside one is going to be nice and soft. The outside one will have that crispiness to it. Street tacos, traditionally, you're going to have the two layers, okay? Mainly because they're corn tortillas. Corn tortillas aren't as strong as your big flour tortilla. And so you have the two layers um, to hold all the stuff so it doesn't just fall apart, okay? Now you can put in whatever you want, really. Sour cream, cheese, uh, chili lime crema, okay, which is queso fresco, um, 
Latin American sour cream. You can use flannel sour cream if you want. Chili powder, lime, or you can just buy some stuff at the store, chili lime crema. Okay, wonderful stuff. Actually, my family, my wife and I, not my daughter, because I don't know why she does. She just doesn't like anything spicy, which equals salt for her. But you can take whatever you want. Put your cheese in here. Don't put your cheese. I forgot I had this stuff in the fridge. Brand new. It doesn't want to cooperate. So take your whatever you want, plain old sour cream, your chili lime. Now, but we have to think about keeping things. Do we want to put a bunch of liquid in here? No, it's going to soak through. You don't want to overfill as well. Flavor balance. So you decide, big chunks, small chunks. Okay, really, I just cubed this. Pico de gallo. You could put cotija cheese, which is just in the specialty cheese section at any grocery store. It's that crumbly stuff. Um, it's that white powdery cheese at Chipotle, way down on the end. They never ask you if you want it or not. Okay, it's cotija cheese. Common street food item. We've got that pico, we could take, whoops, that one's probably burnt. Yeah, that one's a little burnt. So, I think that pan's hot enough. So, you guys ever see Chef Ramsey's, Chef Gordon Ramsey's scrambled egg video in his house? He burns the toast, it's so funny, it's awesome. So, we could just take a little cilantro. We have cilantro in the pico. But we could just take a little bit here. Some fresh lime again. Okay. Or maybe take this lime wedge to prop up our taco. Okay. And we could put a bunch of different lime wedges around to prop up our tacos. Oops, which you guys can't see because I missed my mark. Here we go. Ah, much better. You want to remember to use the one that didn't have the raw chicken on it. We could maybe do something like that. And then we could have our multiple tacos on our plate. However you want to do it. Typical serving is three. That's pretty common. So we'll just do a little bit of these guys. That's hot. Just came out of the pan. Mm. We'll pretend this is cotija. It's actually salt, but yeah. So just something super simple, you guys. So how do you sell this? Well, you're really just trying to sell yourself. If you're not confident in what you're saying, I recommend not going ultra uh, deep dive. Stay high level, but be confident with what you are presenting in the sense, um, try not to open the door to something that you don't know. It's okay if that happens. You get the extra inquisitive guest or student, right? Um, be honest. Do what you say. I'll look up the answer. I'll get back to you. Um, if you can't find it in time, maybe get their number or contact information. Me, personally, I say the same thing, and then I caveat, I'm going to need you to remind me, you know, and then we move on. But it's okay. But you have a lot of that control in your presentation um, just by sticking with what you know. Um, yeah. And so just to, yeah, we're good. 
So we'll Those are beautiful. Thank you. The I key, want one. the big takeaways here, when it comes to plating, height, negative space. So we prop them up with the lime. That's just a technique I stole from um, the internet, to be honest. Um, I'm like, that is genius. So um, we prop them up to show off the food, the colors. Okay, picture we could have some Mexican uh, blended cheeses here. We could have just the cotija cheese, which is typical. Um, go dairy free, no cheese. Well, obviously the crema wouldn't have put that, but the sky's the limit. Color, height, texture, shadowing, lines, angles. This is all the super secret of foo foo plating. Height and negative space. Height is there to draw, to grab the eye. As this is walking through the dining room, you go, oh, wow. Okay, it's not just flat. It's not wrapped up in plastic wrap or cellophane or wax, whatever they use at Taco Bell, wax paper. Okay. Um, it shows off the food, this level of artistry that you can then charge a premium for. Okay, the gold chain is worth more than the gold it's made out of. Why? Art, time, labor, presentation, appreciation, visual, cause an emotional response kind of thing instead of just a lump of gold. These are all the things that we chefs pay attention to and to satisfy that expectation in a higher end establishment instead of just going to Taco Bell. Okay, but height, negative space, don't cover the whole plate. We want that to highlight the food. Analogy I use with the high schoolers is we ain't doing Waffle House here. Nothing wrong with Waffle House, scattered, smother, covered, pepper, capped, and country. But you don't go to Waffle House for the plating. Okay, maybe if you go to Papa Do's, maybe if you go to Shanahan's, maybe if you go to fill in the blank, Maggiano's or whatever, they're, yeah. But you expect artistic presentation. I go to Ted's Montana Grill, I'm expecting a different level than if I were to get the rubber steak at Denny's. It's still steak. So anyway, that I, I can go for hours and hours. And we'll talk more next week, you guys, or next session. Yeah, next week, when, when we do caramel, caramel, apple, slices. That's really where my plating unit is. But I plate every dinner because of practice, quite honestly. I try new things. Will it work? Will it not? I've never considered myself to be the best plater, visual artist in the world. Um, and it's really until I found food, but I, I practice. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So, yeah. And now here's for the jealousy. <laughs> oh, cruelty. Mm. Who's making tacos for dinner? <laughs> <laughs> right. I forgot I used salt instead of the cotija. <laughs> that's a little salty because I put a bunch more salt on it. But oh, that's good. So in the recipe, which I'll send you guys when we when we get offline. Um, sorry, mom. Talk with your mouthful. Which I'll send you when we're done here. Um, it's really with those smaller chunks of, of chicken, four to five minutes at the most. Um, you want about three quarters of a cup to one cup of chicken stock. Um, either in the cartons, um, get the low sodium. You wanna be in control of how much salt is in there. Um, and that's coming from flavor, not from a dietitian. That's, that's, come, that's why I get unsalted butter. Okay, if you want salt in something, add salt. Um, that's my take on the, the, the process. The puzzle is less processed. Um, that's actually technically chicken based, better than bouillon. It's super reduced chicken stock. Because um, I don't really have room for gallons and gallons of stock. So, questions about anything? Fire away. Ooh, a little better this time. We still <laughs> ran long, but better than we've time. Uh, yes, go ahead, Lauren. Why do you shake your pan so often? Slide your pan. Good question. Um, there's two reasons. One, on the line in a restaurant, when you're working elbow to elbow, there's not a lot of places to store your tongs, your spatula, your spoon, your whatever. So that's where saute came from, 
saute is French for jump, actually. So instead of taking the tongs and manipulating each item, we, we got in the habit of just jumping the pan. Um, so that is a one, just sort of a habit. Um, you have to force yourself to not do it, actually. Just leave it alone in those recipes where you're supposed to just not touch it. Uh, so that's our way of mixing and agitating the food. But two, um, check and see if it's stuck using the same technique. Keeping it moving to keep it loose. Again, I cheated. That's a ceramic pan. It's hard to stick anything to that ceramic pan. But with proper temperature control, you get the same reaction with a stainless pan. Um, Non-paid endorsements. Here's what I have. Foodie, Ninja Foodie Never Stick. This pot though is 60 bucks by itself. It's worth it. This stuff will go in the oven. You can use metal utensils too. Non-paid endorsement. I should get some money because I'm telling everybody about this stuff. But, um, and no official, on, on the, the Sears legal, you guys, um, Escoffier has no partnership with any brand or product. This is just Chef Steve's in my house. Um, so don't rat me out. <laughs> well, and I noticed that you never said um, that you use non-stick or that we should use non-stick. True. Um, here's why. You can't properly do a pan sauce using classic technique in a nonstick pan. Your temperature is too high in a conventional nonstick pan, like 20 bucks at King Supers, kind of nonstick. Okay, old school DuPont Teflon from the 30s. Um, and that, that is a potential carcinogen, genetic. Carcinogen, carcin. Yeah, that one, that word. It is, that is a legit issue. Also, many of you uh, might like to use metal utensils. Bad. And uh, not non -stick. Stick. Yeah. Right, because you're flaking off little bits and then we have cancer causing um, and not just the lab rat. So that, that's, so that's why, because we do re high end reductions, we do, or high temp reductions, we'll do um, deglazing of the pan. You got all those yummy bits in the bottom, which I actually left out because um, ceramic pan didn't have a lot of that yummy bits on the bottom. Um, so that's not okay for a nonstick pan. They're not designed for it. My nonstick cookware is. Um, it has to do with it's been, um, it's manufactured at 30,000 degrees instead of 900 or 2000. And so it's specifically designed for that. And it's not as extra special chef wear. It's go on Amazon and get it. I saw it on, a, on an infomercial waiting for the doctor actually, sitting there watching TV. I went, oh, that stuff's awesome. And I went and researched it and poof. Um, about four or $500 for the whole set but it can be even more expensive if you get more product, but you can also piecemeal and, you know, and spread it out. So that's why nonstick bad for searing, for pan sauces, okay? Nonstick eggs. So, yeah. All right, I'm going to stop the recording. Yep. Yeah, Rebecca, yeah, Cotija.